Okay. Hello, All-Star clients, and welcome to another episode of the Veterinary Roundtable presented by All-Star Veterinary Clinic, the podcast where we answer your veterinary-related questions while also having some fun along the way. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to leave us a review on your podcast provider of choice. It helps us appear, oh my dear Lord, it helps us appear in recommended feeds and is greatly appreciated. So we have had massive TikTok expansion, explosion, expansion, explosion. It's been a long day. Exploding kittens everywhere. <laughs> Please. Okay. Um, so thank you, everybody who's following us. We really appreciate it. You know, we love pushing out the content. People like participating. Do you guys like participating? Yeah. Oh, Most yeah. days. <laughs> Except for when we're all hungry, which happens on this podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, we've hit a thousand downloads on the Ooh. podcast, which is also really cool. Ooh. <laughs> okay. So that's pretty cool. Um, you guys, I want to thank you guys for coming tonight and spending your valued hours and minutes. <laughs> with us. So do you want to do introductions? Sure. Yeah. Okay. On today's episode, we have myself, interim co-host, avid researcher and veterinary support specialist, Devin Fortune, soon to be veterinary technician, Bailey Murray, surgery technician, Stephanie Spat, and our head honcho, the head veterinarian of All Star, and my co-host, Dr. Emily King. Thank you. Thank you. As you guys all notice, Devin, aka (laughs) Pop-Tart, is not Dr. Duckwall. Who's been missing Rip. for two weeks? Who knows? I don't know Rip. what's happening. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, she's had other things, I guess. So she'll be back next week. We're not important anymore. Yeah, but you're doing a great job filling Thank in. Thank you. Okay, so everybody's doing okay tonight. Yeah. 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 How was everyone's day? Yeah. Busy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was long. King, how was, was your really day? Busy. It was busy because it was, yeah. We worked together today, so good job. Uh, yeah, our 20-minute appointments, it took a little while no. to get – you didn't like that? Mm. <laughs> I wouldn't – Did you feel like you needed roller skates? Yes. Yeah. Like, I was running around the clinic at times. Yeah. I wish it I was, were acceptable to run around the clinic because I could just That's go. why I run around the clinic. More efficient. People always see me running, and they're like, why are you running? And I was like, oh, just – I save like about a minute. Yeah. So – It's like I'm at a point where I walk too fast. It's like uncomfortable. I just want to run. Yeah. yeah. I really would like someone to be on those shoes with Heelys. The, yes, Heelys. Oh, I want those. Oh my gosh. And so like people could be like rollerblading through the hallway and then like, you know, spin like as if they had like, you know, they were in those mm-hmm. restaurants that have the things and then, you know, you're like, then you deliver your, you don't know what I'm talking about. Mm. That's really young. dangerous though. I need like we have a little, oh, Bailey, come on. I need have a some wheel fun. on my clogs or whatever these are called. It's so dangerous. You would trip over a lot of animals. Or just like an animal would pull you across the room. See, that's also true. That I would mean, be the fun. We've almost gone sledding a few or times. Or you could like, yeah, yeah, you could just like kick your toes up and just hang on. <laughs> just hang on. Go. Yep, exactly. But anyway, yeah, it was one of those kind of days. Yeah. But was. we got it all done. Yes, we did. So let's go on to would you rather questions. Yes. Okay. Number one, would you rather be covered in fur or scales? Stephanie? I feel like that's an easy one. <laughs> fur, definitely. I, I agree. feel like. People want to pet you more. I mean, I know that there's, <laughs> I know that there's not Kyle that. fans and like you know cold blooded fans, but I just feel like fur is soft and mm. I don't know, it's comforting. I feel like you might get annoyed with like everyone touching you, no, though. You know, do you ever think about yeah. animals yeah. being like, stop touching me? That's probably how dogs um, feel all the time. Yeah, or cats. Cats, cats like both. totally. Oh cats are totally giving everybody the finger from time to time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, they're like, get away. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I don't really have good reasoning for fur, but I'd say fur. I've always kind of been grossed out by scales. So I just think they feel weird. I would yeah. say, I don't know. Because at one point I'm like, I would like to shed fur scales, yeah. but at the same time I'd want fur. So I don't know. I yeah. do not think there's an animal that has both. That is your job as AKA researcher. Yeah. Is there an animal that has that could be classified as having both. Stay tuned. I'm trying to think. Stay tuned. I was going to say armadillo. And this is my thought. Okay, I'm I don't know. Maybe they I have. think armadillos have like a sl- like a small layer of hair on them. Okay, well. From what I Stay know. tuned. Next week podcast, that's the teaser. Does it have to be a real animal? Can it be like? It cannot be like some Japanese anime thing. No. Could you say like a hedgehog? Does a hedgehog have scales? No. No. I'm trying to think like of a, f- mm, a fish, but a fish with fur. <laughs> okay, that would be hilarious. If you so find that, I will like pay you. 
a fish with fur if it exists. Do seahorses have scales? Who? Seahorses? Yes. Those are probably small. They don't have fur. They well, don't have I didn't fur. know that little mane thing. Like, what is that made out of? Scales. It's the thing on the back of their... Okay, I'll research. Okay, yes. and I'll let you guys all know. Okay. Yep. Okay. I'm going with scales because, yeah. like, I just have these horrible nightmares of the cats with the mats that's like the whole body mat. <sighs> Mm-mm. Mm-mm. It's a mat with a cat. I do not want to be that cat. No. With a mat. <laughs> Well, hopefully you'd have someone who brushes you and doesn't. I don't know. But like, do you think you could reach your back to brush your back if you wanted to? No. No. I'm not that flexible. And then you have like hair in your mouth when you do brush. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nope. Mm-hmm. And that Velcro tongue. I'm going with scales. Mm-hmm. The Velcro tongue might be worse than the scales. I don't know. I'm still with fur. I'm so going to go with scales. You're going scales too. What? All right. Yeah. Good job. Fur okay. club. Oh, or, the, for club. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay, next. I feel like this one's easy, but anywho. Would you rather know the history of every object you touched or be able to talk to animals? Totally talk to animals. I feel like anyone yeah. you ask in this field is going to say In our to job, animals. like... Yeah. It makes it 10 times easier. Yes. Like, I, it would be so fascinating if they could actually understand what we're saying as we're making up reasons for why they're doing what they're doing mm-hmm. based on what we observe over time. And mm-hmm. so then it's like, they could just be sitting there like, that is not right. What are you talking about? No. Yeah. Because like, like, there's sometimes you have to guess what's wrong yeah. based on the history or based on, you know, and so you're always once removed from the actual information provider because you're going through an owner so i mean yeah you're looking at the pet but the owner's the one helping you interpret the Mm -hmm. behavior of the pet a lot of times but the owner would appreciate that too save some money yeah yeah if they could just tell us like their stomachs hurt would be 100 percent what i need yeah life yeah i'm having flashbacks to gray's anatomy where the doctor the guy the guy does anybody watch gray's anatomy Mm -mm. okay where the you two don't? No. Oh, dear mm-hmm. God. They're just too young. It's stuff. too long okay. for me. I don't want to get attached. <laughs> so the the guy the that was married Derek? to Meredith. Thank you. Okay. what You don't watch it. Come on. Okay. It pops up on things, okay? okay. He's like a dilf. Anyway. So he was, he, was, he was dying and he was in his brain going, don't do that. You got to do this test. You got to do this. I feel like that's what the animals are doing. No, no, no. That's wrong, 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 wrong. Do the other one. Do the other one. Do the other one. And then I he like died. That. I don't know. To see, but if you could talk to them, you would know. You would know. Yeah. I also am just like not that interested in history. Like, I don't want to touch this couch and be like, what is your history? I thought you yeah. were a researcher. Yeah. <laughs> That's different. Yeah. Maybe. Well, mm-hmm. also, like, different. if you touch something that has like PTSD behind it, I don't want that in my life. Like, you have to be a special person, to, like, want that. I feel like, like, in a good way, but you have to be like a history guru, you know? Yeah. What about you, Stephanie? What are you thinking? Talk to Watch animals. Or like definitely history? talk to animals. Yeah, and just like even like outside of the field, just talking to your own pets, yeah. I feel like would be entertaining. But then you have to think about like late at night when your cat's like crying for food, it's going to be actually talking. <laughs> I would be hey, so scared. Scared. hey, hey, wake up, hey. hey. <laughs> so hey, I guess yeah. it has its pros and cons. True. I have a cat that will crawl up in your bed and poke you in the face. So. That's Mine will kind of equivalent of saying food, drool? food, food. Yes. <laughs> Ew. I had a cat that drooled whenever it was happy when I was growing up. So it would sit on your lap and you'd pet it and it would just want to drool. Is that Aww. how yours is? Yep. yep. I have one that eats my That's hair good. and will drool over my hair. Yeah. But I it's not my personal cat because I'm allergic to him. Oh. I mean, I already <laughs> talked to my cat, but he just doesn't talk back. So there's Fair that. It's one sided relationship. Okay. <laughs> Last but not least, would you rather be married to a 10 with a bad personality or a 6 with an amazing personality? <laughs> you first, because you're married. Yeah, I'm married, so I'm going to say I have the Moment best of, of both worlds. I'm married to a 10, and he has an amazing <laughs> personality. There we go. I yeah. avoided any kind of fight Fight later. Good job. Yeah, thanks. But if I had to, I don't know. Does the person talk that's the 10? I think so because the personality has to show somehow. If it was just like a like a little, I think I convert. Situation. I could convert the six to a ten. Makeover. Yes, 
What and about like I an would eight? have the good personality, but I don't think you could. Could you compromise? Say it's an eight with an okay personality? Maybe. I just don't know. <laughs> what do you, you think? You're, you're married to too. What do you think, Stephanie? Oh, well, you are married? Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> putting, like, just in general, like, from past relationships or whatever, I always have felt that personality matters way more over looks because I just feel like, like, sure, you'll be stuck. Like, if you're married to a 10, like, sure, they look good. But then if they treat you wrong, you have to deal with that the rest of your life. And then yeah. you're dealing with other people saying how attractive they are. But, but they they're really know. a dick. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> didn't mean to say that. <laughs> so, so if we yeah, sit no. here and say our husbands are the six, they're going to be like, thanks. Thanks for saying I have an amazing personality, but I'm just a six. But I don't think my husband specifically See. is a six. Right. See, in my own eyes, he's a ten yep. already, but just a ten, maybe eleven, twelve, <laughs> or thirteen. I read these questions off to my boyfriend, and he was like, "Well, I'm a six. and I was like, "Okay, <laughs> humble." <laughs> but there's like a thing behind it that women fall for personality before looks, and that men go for looks before personality. So I, I think all women go for a six with a good personality before they go for a ten. I'm with you guys. You are Six too. with an amazing personality. <laughs> yep. You just want to have fun. Girls yeah. just. Oh, <laughs> yeah, Blondes have more fun. Blondes have more fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, Moving gosh. <laughs> All right. So we're on to case collections. Who wants to start first? This has been a very popular part of the podcast, which I think is really cool because I never really, I mean, I guess I thought that people would like to hear about it, but- not as much as people like to hear. But I thought. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is like amazing. So actually, hearing like what we. I see like to listen today. to it because I'm not here for the good ones. So I listen to it and I hear what I'm missing out well, on. Well, you know, and we're so big. The clinic's so big now that we do have the benefit of seeing so many cases. And I think, oh, you know, what when we were younger, the cl- the clinic was younger. You know, you had to. It's all a numbers game. Mm-hmm. You know, in terms of you know this this disease happens one in so many cases. Mm-hmm. And so then it's just a numbers game. Like how often are you going to see it or whatnot? And so as you get bigger and bigger, the opportunities, you know, present themselves more frequently. So I think that might also be like, it's a chance for people. Like you say, I don't, I'm not around. I don't get to see those types of cases. Yeah. So like sometimes you guys say something and I'm like, that happened. Yeah. And then yeah. I'm like, wait. <laughs> so who wants to go first? I can. Okay. <laughs> um. So we had a dog, um, come in last week for eye irritation. Um, I got the history. It was a curbside appointment, so it was kind of like fast, but I went out and got the history, and, and the owner just said that that morning they noticed some something weird with the eyes and vomiting, which the dog did not have a history of. So we brought her inside um, and start, kind of started just looking at her eyes, and Dr. Duckwall kind of like opened her eyelids a little bit, and you notice like a ring of puffiness, um, kind of like the sclera, I guess. It's called sclera edema. Um, Dr. Duckwall had never seen anything like it, neither did I, but when you opened the eyelid, there was a ring, and the part of the eye that had been covered by the eyelid wasn't puffy, but everything else was, except for like the iris and the pupil, so it was kind of weird. Looked like a marshmallow almost. (laughs) So what did she do? Oh, yes. We, um, we just gave the dog Benadryl and eye drops, and the next day it was back to normal. So, allergic reaction. But so that's what she was blaming it on. Maybe mm-hmm. the dog got stung yeah, by something, yeah, or on the grass, or yeah, spiders are everywhere right now. I feel like we have a lot of allergies going around, even allergic reactions. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it was weird. That's awesome. And the dog wasn't bothered by it at all, but it was like one of those pains where like you feel. Like so the peripheral, did it look eye. like just the eye was puffy, like the whole outside part of the eye well, or no, the like, white part of the eye? It looked normal scl- at just the first glance, but then when you actually looked at the eye, oh, the, okay, it was just like raised. So the uh, the white part of the eye, the sclera, mm-hmm. was all puffy. Yeah. It looked like marshmallow. Yeah. So but like not even the iris right. or the pupil. Or the cornea. It was like- That was all normal. It was normal and then it was puffy. Just all puffy on the outside. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh-huh. Well, I'm glad she responded to mm-hmm. conservative therapy. That's great. I have, I can have Dr. Duckwell submit pictures okay. and see if we get banned on TikTok, but we shouldn't. It's just an eyeball. Just an eye. Bailey, what about you? Um, so I'm using a case from my school because it's a really interesting one that we had recently. Um, our p- 
little pet. Her name's Lola. She's like an Aussie mix, an Australian Shepherd mix. She came in from the shelter and she was there for about a week. And then she, we came in one day and she was down in the back. So couldn't have like no function of her back legs at all. So we moved her to a smaller cage. So that way she wouldn't injure herself more. Our doctor came in and saw that it was IVDD. So intervertebral disc disease. And she had slipped one of her discs in her like, um, like her lumbar sacral junction area Mm -hmm. where it went to the left more. So she was um, worse in her left side than her right side. And she didn't have any like um, CPs, I guess. Mm -hmm. And she didn't have very much of anything else going on with her back legs. So they obviously checked blood pressure to make sure she was still getting blood back there and things like that. And then we medically managed for about three weeks. I want to say she was on gabapentin three times a day, trazodone, um she was on rimadil for twice a day and a few other meds i mean we were medicating her very heavily and we walked her with um stirrups or um yeah like stirrups i guess and then somebody generously donated wheels to us Mm -hmm. so now she has wheels but her cps got better over time and now she's walking by herself so she walks out in the run by herself and she got moved to a larger cage recently and yeah, she's doing a lot better. But whenever she goes outside, she has to have her wheels on just to make sure. But it was kind of crazy because like we were thinking about a hemilaminectomy, hemilaminectomy, but it was just not like a choice with price and she's from the shelter. So it's harder. Sure. But I'm pretty sure right now she's up for adoption. So Aww. if anybody wants to adopt her. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so if it's, you know, the way they're going to diagnose that is going to be with a CT or an MRI, most likely. Mm -hmm. Um, And we used to use um, regular radiology or x-rays back in the day, and we would use dye studies to be able to determine Mm -hmm. where the disc impingement was. But nowadays with advanced imaging, we'll use advanced imaging to determine the disc impingement. Did she have that done yet? We just did x-rays. X-rays. But they kind of... You could feel where it was almost. Mm -hmm. So um, they did a bunch of like nervous system tests. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. It's like where you pinch down the back, that one. Uh, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. That's a paniculus reflex. Yeah. We did that. And then she just kind of got better over time. We we just kept checking CPs and did a lot of physical therapy with her. Yeah. I mean, the disc, what happens is that disc gets swollen and then it puts pressure on the spinal cord and Mm -hmm. spinal cord doesn't have anywhere else to go because it's surrounded in bone. So then that pressure causes deficits and the deficits always occur, occur behind wherever the lesion is. So that's why just her back legs are affected, right? Mm -hmm. So um, and then w- the goal, and, and like you mentioned, sometimes you can have asymmetry associated with the disc protrusion. So it can be putting pressure more on one side than another. So that kind of happened with our Rolo dog. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, they, the pressure exists more on one side than the other. Um, if the dog goes down completely in the back end and loses all of its motor function, meaning it's unable to walk mm-hmm. and it no longer has deep pain, which means when you squeeze its foot, it doesn't acknowledge the pain so there's a difference between it pulling its foot away and actually saying oh that hurts Mm -hmm. and so if they no longer acknowledge the pain then those are emergent situations and the impingement needs to be removed from the spinal cord within 24 hours in order for the dog to not be paralyzed otherwise the dog loses function and is paralyzed for the rest of its life but in some of these cases if you can avoid getting to that place where they lose deep pain and motor function you can use medical therapy and bed rest Mm -hmm. i think our neurologist that we refer to dr sangster and dr cross the two of them they'll use a time frame of about six weeks to say you give the pet about six weeks that's as good as you're probably ever going to get from the dog in terms of motor function at that six week mark yeah, she, so, I think it was about, I'm going to say about six weeks ago or a month ago. Yeah. And she's doing perfect now. I mean, within two weeks, she was standing up on her own. Yeah. Good. And she was urinating on her own for the first two days. She was not. So yeah. we were kind of worried. And then now she's perfectly fine. Back to normal. Besides just a little bit, it needs a little bit more help sure. than normal. But yeah, she's doing great. There's another interesting um, disease that can occur that can mimic um 
intervertebral disc disease, which looks like a disc, which would be, they probably talked about it, but an FCE, which is a fibrocartilaginous emboli. So they actually throw a clot to their spinal cord. Mm -hmm. And so then the same thing happens. You get deficits in the rear. Those patients can be a little bit more painful. So they, um, and, but you still have that acute onset. Again, the advanced imaging is usually how they're determining the difference between those two. And your patient, you know, it's hard because of the scenario that it was in yeah. in terms of funding and things like that. That makes it really difficult. And we're just like a teaching facility right. that doesn't have very much. So right. Don't we have were, the advanced diagnostics. Yeah, like we don't have like an that. MRI or a CT like right. Purdue would. But then we also have our digital x-ray that we just got at my school. So yeah, that's awesome. We're just excited. Yeah, for sure. Well, CTs? I'm so glad she's doing well. Um, Conscious proprioception proprioception it's where um if you ever see like a vet they'll pick up their back feet and put them like upside down on the ground and then they wait for them to write it themselves so it's knowing where their feet are in space yep is it like a time? just what proprioception is is it measured in time just knowing that your foot is okay. so if i turn the dog's foot over and it doesn't acknowledge that it's foot because that's not normal mm -hmm. you would they would just flip it yeah. right back over and so they should do it about like that quick okay. they should be like my foot's not supposed to be this way i need to turn it this way if they do not know where their foot is in space they leave it there mm -hmm. and so then that means that their proprioception's affected and okay. they lose depending on how significant the neurologic dysfunction you know, um, or loss is the more you end up losing like over time mm -hmm. or based on the impingement. So it might start with just ataxia or, you know, change in motor function. Mm -hmm. It might start with mild proprioceptive deficits. Then it progresses to, you know, another deficit, another deficit is missing. Now deep pain is gone. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so it can escalate just, all the okay. way up. Yeah. Okay. So you can have all these variations in between. Yeah, we're yeah. told in school if they are an IBDD patient and they have loss of deep pain for more than 24 hours, there's no like right. turning back. Right. They will be paralyzed. And now, it doesn't matter when in the 24 hours you correct the deficit according to the research. It just has to be corrected in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And so those are – we don't have very many emergency cases in no. veterinary medicine, but that's one of them. So It's like if your dog goes down in the back, bring it in. Yep. That shouldn't be something that waits. So. Yeah. Stephanie, what about you? So mine's interesting in the fact that it was kind of a surprise and not what he was presenting for. And um, the owner even kind of had a laugh about it afterwards. But um, one-year-old large breed dog, um, which is a Great Dane, came in for his neuter um, as scheduled. And the owner had elected to do a gastropexy at the same time, um, which because he's deep chested, um, the gastropexy essentially will tack the stomach to the abdominal wall so that it can't flip on itself and cause a GDV, um, which is common in deep chested dogs. And so that was scheduled. Um, Dr. Pulse did the procedure. Um, I believe she started with the gastropexy first before the neuter portion. Um, so she did have to cut into the abdomen. And so basically she's, you know, in the abdomen, um, you know, getting a hold of the stomach, getting ready to kind of start that whole thing. And um, she just kind of happened to notice like, hmm, there's kind of a firm spot um, in this area of the stomach. And she's like feeling a little bit more. And it's definitely something that's like hard, like it's not food, um, which she shouldn't have had food anyway, because they're supposed to be fasted for surgery. And so um, I believe she might have asked another doctor to um, kind of check it out too. Um to kind of get confirmation, but basically, so, um, you know, we had kind of texted the owner, letting them know what was going on and that we were going to go ahead and, um, cut into the stomach essentially to take it out. Um, and sure enough, it was a foreign object. And the funny part was it was a little, um, those little like tables that you see on a pizza, like the little, oh, they look yeah, like yeah, tiny yeah. little tables that you, like holds the pizza and like, yeah, it holds the, the like top of the pizza yeah, the, the box. box. Yeah. Um, and then there's just like a tiny little bits of like other random materials, but it was just funny because the little table was intact. Like it was just the, the full table. Um, yeah. so removed it, no issues, closed, um, you know, uneventful recovery. Everything was fine. Um, it was just kind of a surprise foreign body that we weren't expecting that day, but everything ended up okay in the end. So. See, that's when it'd be nice for your animals to be able to talk to you. 
Right. Like, did you eat that? <laughs> right. That's one thing you have to trust. I feel yeah, like all of I not did lie, the other day. I like, what'd like, you uh, eat? I woofed the pizza down and forgot the table was there. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, I feel like a lot of them would be like toddlers, though. Like, you didn't see anything. Right. You didn't see that. Right. Yeah. That so, did not happen. I, like I have proof. <laughs> <laughs> I literally just watched you eat it. The liars. Oh, my gosh. Um, my case is a case of Dr. Schmokes, who had a... Poor Dr. Smoke. I feel like she sees like all these. Um, but anyway, it's a six-year-old um, uh, terrier mix that came in for um, hypothermia, respiratory depression, um, drooling. What else? To, I, you were helping her with that case, I think. The And the dog, the history was that the dog had possibly gotten into um, hydrocodone syrup. Um, and so, and that's pretty flavorful. So, um, and he spilt <laughs> the whole bottle. We just weren't sure how much of it he ate and so, or drank or licked up or whatever, but his presentation would suggest that he had gotten into the hydrocodone. I think a couple of meds were spilt, but that was the one that, um, was a liquid that was flavored. So we were suspicious that, and the owner was suspicious that he had licked up the hydrocodone. So when he came in, he was pretty out of it and depressed and cold Mm -hmm. and which are common side effects of an overdose with something like that. Mm -hmm. So then um, Dr. Schmoke had um, uh, another staff member run to MedVet and we got naloxone, which is a reversal agent. So it binds the hydromorphin so that it takes away the effect. And then we gave that to him and he responded nicely and did great. Good. Drug overdose. Never thought that. (laughs) I mean, we see like them eat things that mm-hmm. are just Foreign. like, yeah. Pizza tables or like yeah. chocolate. I mean, we've had some weird f- emergency phone calls That's too some... about like a different cat meds. eating an amphetamine. Yeah. We've had and the un- person swore it was still alive. Yeah. There's that one dog that ate underwear. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. There's all kinds of fun things like that. Yeah. So, yeah. But he went home and recovered like nothing happened. Well, that's good. Yay. Just a little. <laughs> Bad hangover the next day, maybe. But. <laughs> so, but no, it was weird. Yeah, it was really nice to be able to have the naloxone to reverse them. So, does anyone ever find out what happened to that one dog of Schmokes that had a like 104 fever, but was completely fine, like acted completely fine, but had a 100.4 or 104 fever? The fever of unknown origin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't yeah. know. Did she ever was, come to a conclusion? like two days ago? She was okay. So yeah, oh, I think okay. she was treating her um, empirically after her initial workup was unremarkable. Though, so then she was treating her for infectious disease. I think we just gave fluids, and then there are really difficult cases to work up because you could be chasing a needle in a haystack. Mm-hmm. So typically, with those cases, we do a generalized workup. So we'll go looking for disease that um, using our non-invasive diagnostics, and then. Based on that information, a lot of times that'll give us some of the time that'll give us the answer. A lot of times it doesn't. And so then we treat the patient empirically based on the information that we have. Hmm. So that pet was started on antibiotics, fluids, and um, uh, one or two dose of an anti-inflammatory and responded quickly. Good. So she's doing well. That is good to hear. So we have a follow-up question from Becca's case on TikTok. She discussed um, Dr. Dudley's soft tissue sarcoma removal. Mm -hmm. And the question is, would you guys ever discuss sugar packing a wound for wound care? And that is a great question. Um, We are going to um, put that question off until next week because Dr. Schmoke Mm -hmm. has um, a couple of patients that we're treating wounds on. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be back next week or the next episode on the podcast and we'll all be talking about wound care and sugar packing and some of the other techniques that we use for managing wound care well tuesday after next right tuesday after next i didn't want them to be waiting around yes so So stay tuned stay tuned yeah eight five five one thank you (laughs) (laughs) yeah because we're going to get to that and a whole lot more so okay so this week's question is hey doctors dog Doctors. I think that's okay. I have a question for you. I am currently in college and am a small animal science major. I'm recently running into an issue of getting in. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm going to try and read this. This is her question is very thorough. And so I want to make sure I don't screw it up. I'm recently running into an issue of getting animal experience for vet school. I already have 500 hours working in a kennel and 200 hours working at a vet hospital as an intern. I've emailed at least 30 hospitals asking if they do insurance internships for pre-vet students 
and if the internship could possibly lead into a position later on down the line. I had an interview to be a tech near my school, and they said they hired a lot of students near my school, and I talked with the manager, and she saw my resume and knew I was a student. They said they were extremely accommodating for students since they hire so many, and they know they need the hours. They brought me in for an interview, and they basically told me most people who want to be a tech or want to be a vet are broken. That really turned me away from wanting to work there anyway. They emailed me two weeks later and said, we are looking for someone with more experience. Anyways, what are your recommendations for getting more hours? Because hospitals are not answering or just flat out saying no. Even if you apply for a tech job, they want someone full time. And it's hard being able to do that with having my day start at 8 a.m. and going to 4 p.m. Any recommendations would help as it's very hard. Thanks. Taylor. Cherkaskas. I practiced that one. Way to go, Idaho. (laughs) Okay, yes, you bailed me out of that. All right, Stephanie, you want to start? Sure. Okay. (laughs) I feel like, you know, there's kind of a lot to unpack with that question. Um, When I think about it, I guess, you know, as far as getting experience, if that's, you know, what you're going for, um, maybe kind of look outside of veterinary clinics. Um, I was thinking, you know, a lot of um, places that really need the help would be like shelters, um, rescues, anything like that, that, you know, works directly with animals, um, but not necessarily a clinic. Um, So maybe reaching out to them, just saying that, you know, you you want more experience, you want hours, um, you know, that you have, you already have experience. So, you know, they'll look at that and be like, oh, like she knows what she's doing. Um, And so that might be an option to reaching out to shelters. And then the other thing I was thinking of, which is something that I did early on um, when I was looking for a job and I felt like no one was responding, I was just going to places in person. Um, I, you know, I would dress nice, kind of look the part and I would just go in and, you know, let them know that I was looking for a position and this is what, um, you know, experience I've had in the past and Mm -hmm. kind of just put my best foot forward. And I feel like um, quite a few places kind of look at that and they're impressed, um, you know, they see that as you're taking initiative. Um, so that might be something. So the places that haven't responded to you, um, you know, maybe just go in person um, and ask about it and kind of follow up on that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, I feel like there's a lot more, I guess, that can go into that too. Um, also just thinking about, um, you know, do you necessarily want to put yourself through the stress of having a full-time school and a job, you know, because if you're going to school from eight to four, that means you'll have to work from what, like five or six to, you know, 10 at night. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. also kind of weigh out, you know, hey, do you, do you want to be um, tired and exhausted? Um, So maybe hold off on the job for now until, um, you know, say you, you get into vet uh, school and, um, there's going to be a lot of uh, chances there to really get experience in that field. Um, so I guess I'm just not sure, you know, if the vet school requires you to have a certain number of hours of experience or not. But um, those are just kind of my opinion on the subject. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And going off of what you said about how um, some easier options might be like shelters or rescues. I know I had service leadership in high school, which is like a class where you can go volunteer and get a certain number of hours so you don't have to, you know, have a class. It's like a release period kind of. And I volunteered um, at this organization called Reigns of Grace. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of it? Mm -hmm. Um, Like (laughs) R-E-I-N-S. And so it was with horses and um, there are just volunteer opportunities like that that aren't necessarily shelters or vet clinics, just people that need help. Yeah. I think low cost spay neuter clinics, mm-hmm. that's another mm-hmm. place where sometimes they, you know, um, need additional hands. Emergency clinics, if you can, since you, you're you there during, you're, you're busy during school hours, which a lot of time are office hours, then maybe even just picking up two shifts on a weekend mm-hmm. or something, you know, like where other clinics might be closed or they're less than ideal hours for people that are that have families or whatnot. And so then they're looking for people from, you know, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And you mm-hmm. could do a Friday or a Saturday or something like that where you still have time to recover. And then, but I think that to Stephanie's point, I mean, I think focusing on school and getting through school, you have a lot of hours already. So 
clearly your interest is there or the um, impression that your interest is mm-hmm. there that you're putting the time in, but then focusing now on school and getting through school. You know, I've told the story before where like I never worked in a small animal practice until my fourth year of veterinary school. So I didn't have any veterinary experience when I went to interview at veterinary school at university of Tennessee or anywhere for that matter. Um, so um, I don't know if it's always needed. Mm-hmm. I think there can be other things that I think it's important to know they, the reason why they would want you to have it would be to know that, do you really want to spend your time and money pursuing this? And the only mm-hmm. way to know that is to be somewhat put your foot in the industry yeah. to know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that's their main purpose behind it. I think that you can, figure that out in other ways. Um, And so, you know, other facilities, like what you're speaking of, Mm -hmm. the reins, you know, I think that um, other extracurricular activities, I think are just as valuable, you know, that show that you can manage your time, Mm -hmm. that you're a team player, that you're, you know, like there's a lot of personality characteristics that you can glean from someone's activities and it doesn't have to be veterinary Mm -hmm. medicine related Mm -hmm. the thought most of the time is i can teach you whatever you need to know veterinary medicine wise but i can't teach you how to be a hard worker or Mm -hmm. how to be charismatic or how to be nice to people or Mm -hmm. you know i mean those are things that are innate qualities that people have that make them good at this job and so i think um those you can develop in other Mm -hmm. things they don't Mm -hmm. have to be just working in a clinic Mm -hmm. clubs at school stuff like that Show that you're easy to teach and open to learning, stuff like that. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I'm the one that's a big one because I'm in school right now from eight to four most days. Mm -hmm. Um, I work here from three to six or like today I got out at noon. So I worked here from one till six. Um, But I do go to school full time and then I come here and work part time, I guess. And then next Mm -hmm. my next term, I'll be here a lot more because it'll be my surgery term. But I recommend job shadowing anywhere you can. Anywhere that will let you job shadow, job shadow. That's what got me into here. I job shadowed in June of last year and I applied for the position in July. Mm -hmm. And I got hired in um, our lead technician. Amber said that it was because I stood out at my job shadow. So I recommend job shadowing everywhere or touring places will help you know if you actually want to work there. Like Mm -hmm. some places, um, we were told a story in school that somebody went to didn't tour at a clinic, but then found out when she was externing there that they kept a coffee pot in their surgery suite. You don't really want to work somewhere that does that. So maybe not go there or just tour, ask for a tour. A lot of clinics do that. We do that here. Mm -hmm. Um, And we also take on a lot of job shadows here. So, I mean... I know a bunch of people have gotten hired off of a job shadow before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, job shadows are really helpful because, yeah. and you can't really volunteer if it's a for profit business. Well, the labor laws in Indiana anyway don't allow us to do that because it's taking hours, volunteer hours, take hours away from people that are getting paid. So they do not let it, allow us to have volunteers. Mm-hmm. So um, that's how. We, we get around it, but I didn't say that. But that's how we do that is we have the job shadows and it can't be a consistent repetitive thing, but we can say, yeah, sure. Come in, check us out, check out the, mm-hmm. you know, spend time with a mm-hmm. position that you might be interested in. Get to know us. Get to know us. Yeah. I think the other thing too is, cause you did J. Everett Light, right? So like the high school programs that are out there and you're past this cause now she's in college, right? Mm, sounds like it. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean- you're past this kind yeah, of situation, but for those people out there that aren't taking part in those types of programs, I think are helpful because that gets you into clinics. Mm-hmm. And I mean, those are for the, for the employer, they're a working interview and mm-hmm. it's really easy to, I love because for Light. Yeah. J. Everett Light, you have to do clinicals um, yeah. for a whole like half semester like, or a whole semester. It's like from March to May. So yeah, like it's so like half a semester. You have to do a, a whole round of clinicals mm-hmm. and it helps you get your skills down, but also like get to know a clinic and get to know what they actually are about. Yeah. But I also have friends in school who work night shift at uh, MedVet or IndyVet in Indiana and they work from like six o'clock until two in the morning Mm -hmm. and then she goes home sleeps and then goes to school the next day 
Yeah. Which I applaud her because I could <laughs> never do that. I can't even say um, it's 11. But she says that like night shift for the emergency clinics isn't as bad. So she's able to like take a nap if she needs to or things like that. But normally she's working on like homework, studying and doing paperwork at the clinic as well. Sure. So, I mean, it's a good way to get your foot in the door. And if you're in emergency med, you might see cooler cases than mm-hmm. we do. Or if you're in shelter med, you'll see a lot of cooler cases too. I mean, sad, heartbreaking ones, but you also see their progress. And that's one thing that I say whenever somebody asks me if I like vet med, I say I like seeing the progress. It's not about the animals. It mm-hmm. is, but it's also about like their progress medically. Mm-hmm. And I feel like most of the stuff that I'm learning day to day is like based off of cases, like cool cases. Mm-hmm. I'll like ask questions and then learn that thing. And then the next day there's another cool case and just stuff like that. I don't think I would have made it throughout through school without working here, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. So, yeah, I mean, you know, to a couple of her points, I mean, just stay after it. It, you know, don't give up. I think Stephanie made a great point about putting your best foot forward and, Unfortunately, the industry is, you know, um, littered with um, burnout and poor cultures in a lot of facilities. And so, you know, if that's the vibe you get when you're in there, you really don't want to be in there because it's Mm -hmm. not going to be helpful. So just, you know, I think you leave that one and you say, you know, from the standpoint of an interview or you know, if you are walking around to facilities to tour them or to job shot of them and then just be like, okay, I'm glad I'm not going to be there, you mm-hmm. know, and you'll find the place that, you know, but the the way to find them is look at client reviews because whatever is happening in the clinic culture, the clients feel it. And so if the clients are um, talking about things in their reviews, that should be your way of finding a clinic that has that atmosphere or that culture that you're looking for. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, whatever's happening, it's it, the clients know it and the clients can feel it. So they will talk about it in their reviews. And so I think that's an easy way to try and find some places potentially that mm-hmm. might be a better fit. Yeah. What I tell people is in the vet field, we're understaffed. A yeah. lot of clinics are. Um, so I tell them that you're the one in need. So if you don't, if you go to interview and you don't like the place, go find somewhere else. Apply yeah. to every place. Yeah. Someone's apply to every place or job shot at every place and see what you like. Yep. Because you're the one who's actually in need and they're not. They need you more than what yeah. you need them. So, yeah. So, yeah. Hopefully that I, anybody else have anything else to add? Hopefully that helps. I don't think so. I know. If it doesn't, Taylor, reach back out to us. We can yeah. provide some additional information or help. Yeah. So. Are we done? Okay, we are finished. Do you want to do the outro? You do the outro. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Veterinary Roundtable. Remember, send in those questions and be sure to follow us on all social media platforms at All Star Veterinary Clinic. If you enjoyed this episode or a previous episode, leave us a review on your podcast provider of choice. We'll see you in a few weeks for the next episode of the Veterinary Roundtable. Thank you. Woo! Woo!